This week on What's Your Story, we feature Dr. Manoj Shah, a philanthropist whose impact spans across continents. Dr. Shah has over 38 years of experience in the automotive, hospitality, health, trading, finance, and property development industries. He has spearheaded many successful projects, culminating in the growth of Kingsway Group of Companies. Tonight, together with a panel of seven, we interact with this legend through his autobiography, One in a Million. On What's Your Story? Everyone has a story. Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of What's Your Story? As promised you a couple of weeks ago, uh, we decided to just extend a conversation we had uh, with my guest back then. He is no stranger in this country and indeed the nations of the world, highly decorated, highly celebrated, recognized by presidents and royalty for his work in community and also his work as a lion. That's none other than Dr. Manoj Shah. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you for availing us the time. Thank you. And like we promised <coughs> our audience, this is when we get to delve deep into this book, One in a Million. We have with us a group of young, enterprising uh, Kenyans who are very energetic right about now. And I will have them quickly introduce themselves uh, because we, they have read this book, they know this man, and we just figured why not just get a few people around to just extrapolate and just extend and hopefully represent your voice, your questions, your thoughts, and these are the people to do it. So maybe we start from you, Miss Jane. <laughs> okay, so good evening. My name is Jane Gatti. I am a brand and uh, business development consultant or rather expert. Uh, what I do is basically um, help businesses and people to create or rather tell their personal uh, brands or corporate brands. I have been in the space for more than 10 years now, basically just curating stories uh, for businesses to their consumers or customers. Thank you so much for coming. What, what did you read? Give me one thing you read in this book that just totally wowed you. I think Dr. Manoj, you told us about how you integrated your extended family into building the business empire that it is today. How would you encourage young Africans like us who avoid black tax at all costs to incorporate our family members into building businesses with us together uh, for the betterment of our families? Because a lot of us tend to want to get our own and run very quickly far away from our family members. I love that. Thanks for your contribution. And you, Mr. Brian, looking very sharp. So my name is Mo Brian. I'm the... I work with Centre and uh, the Special Economic Zones um, as the Business Development Coordinator. And besides that, I'm a youth leader. Uh, I'm a proud also father and a husband. And, um, you know, I'm in the youth space. I like mentoring uh, young people, young people my age. But the only way I'm able to do that is by drawing wisdom from, you know, um, uh, gems such as Dr. Yeah, who have gone ahead of us and who have a track record yeah. that has a good reputation. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so I'm excited to be part of this uh, panel. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and uh, my reading to the book, I can say one thing that I got from the book is um, one quote that was mm -hmm. quoted that says, you know, you are a person in this world, but to someone, you are the world. Wow. And any time I look at him, I see truly the title of that book, One yes. in a Million, yes. from the words that I, I felt from the book. My name is Eunice Sige. I am a communication specialist, and I'm really excited to be here today because Dr. Manoj is an inspiration to not only me and also to many others. I like that. You, you can hear everything that uh, has inspired these young people. Wonderful. Nathaniel. So my name is Nathaniel Mojai. I am passionate about mental health and leadership, uh -huh. uh, separately, not together. Okay. Uh, but I am also very interested, and I am a dedicated lion. I am a leader at Leo's, and I've known uh, Dr. Manoj for a couple of years now, and we've met in different countries. And I'm just curious to know, um, you know, apart from him being very serious and you know a leader for lions, not only in this continent but also in the world, yeah. I'm passionate to know about him on a more relaxed manner, mm. you know, about golf, about, you know, F1 or the rally in our case. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm passionate about that. I want to know what he is out of the big titles and responsibilities that he holds. Yeah. Yes. So kind of like all work and no play makes 
Manoj Adalboy. Oh, but he plays. So you should see him dancing. <laughs> oh, don't yeah. tempt me to have him dance here for us. So he yeah. dances too. Yeah. And if he tells you he does not, I'll show you a video. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> don't check all my seniors. Okay, sorry. sorry um, yeah, he's still my senior, so I cannot okay. forget. <laughs> Thanks, Nathaniel. I'm glad you're here. You're most welcome. Okay, Harriet Chabet. Yes, so my name is Harriet Chabet Mok, yes. and I am the CEO founder of a company known as Harriet's Botanicals. And we retail traditional indigenous medicine for the urban African and diaspora market. I play in the manufacturing and in the retail space. I have 16 outlets and I manufacture. I am five years old as an entrepreneur. Uh, prior to that, I was an investment banker in London. So for me, what really intrigues me about uh, Dr. Shah is his entrepreneurial brilliance, his business brilliance. I'm very keen to find out what was going on in his mind at a particular stage yeah. when he was just starting out, when he didn't think he'd grow to this extent. I'm very, you know, there's a, a, a quote or there's something that he said in the book. He said, a brand is not what you tell your customers you are, but what your customers tell other people about you. Wow. So I'm really intrigued by this idea of brand building from a personal perspective. Mm. Okay. That's powerful. You just quoted the quote. You and Brian are just quoting quotes from your head. That's wonderful. You're most welcome, Harry. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Timothy. My name is Timothy Carrier, and um, I'm a personal finance and investment coach, also a financial market analyst. Um, I'm so passionate about uh, investments, uh, finance, and um, that has been my key goal uh, in terms of mentoring and especially the youth. And uh, when I read through the book, uh, what triggered me so much was about uh, overcoming obstacles. Because right now, uh, most of the people that we have around, especially the new beginners in terms of entrepreneurship, and also even when it comes to personal finance, there are those obstacles uh, that are very common, and especially to the youth. And um, yeah, I'm here to tap that mind and also the grace, because I want to be maybe, yeah. The yes. next Dr. Manoj. The next Dr. Manoj. Just say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. And I like what yes. you've said, because it's, it's never really a straight line, is mm. it? Like these curves and detours <laughs> and whatnot. So now that you're all doing quotes, Brian and Chebet will not like overshadow us over here. Let me start with one from the book, uh, directly related to the title, One in a Million. And the quote says, uh, first of all, the subtitle is an institution in himself. That's page 101. So the quote says, don't be one of a million. Be one in a million. Your self-worth is never about what you own. Your self-worth comes from what you create. I mean, that was just kapow. Like, I just read that. I said, okay, let's, in, in, that, that's the book. You know, not what you own, but what you create. And when you look at your story, uh, Dr. Sharp, you see that every step of the way you have been creating, and not just for yourself, but for millions, and, and that's an understatement across the world. But you know, as with anything that's up here, uh, there has to be roots, and there has to be foundations. So let's go, not even to just that point where your father passed on and you had to take up the mantle, but even before that, what was a young Manoj like? For example, a 10-year-old Manoj. My younger days, yes, were full of youth. I used to be an ardor student. I used to walk to school every day. I used to be really a mama's boy and be very disciplined in whatever I do. I, since my young days in my primary school and in my secondary school, I never let failure overtake me. And that was one of my mantras that I started off at a very young age. But what is interesting about my younger days is that why was I like that in my younger days and how have I replicated them as the years have gone by 65 years later? And the re simple reason starts from a seed that was planted by my mother. And my mother has been my biggest inspiration. In fact, one in a million has been dedicated to my mother. She actually held my hand. She instilled great values in me since I was a young boy. She nurtured me to the man I was. And in all my good times and bad times, my mother was 
I wouldn't say the only person, but one of the only persons there soothing me, calming me down and telling me that the sun will shine tomorrow. Every day is not a rainy day. So she kept on keeping me going, even in the lowest of my days, as I grew up as a young kid. Unfortunately, in those days, my young life was not as exciting as many of you may have had. And that was, of course, for simple reasons. Uh, one was the economic situation of the family wasn't there. But more importantly, my father, at that point in time, felt sick. And I had a lot of responsibilities that I had to take on my shoulders since I was 16 years old. So whilst people of my age at that time used to go out to nightclubs, coffee shops, you know, play a lot of sports, my priorities had shifted and I had something else to take care of. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I would like to share with you is that my mother was a great philanthropist since my younger days. She was the one of the very few that was recognized by Mother Teresa because she was a volunteer at the Mother Teresa's home on a regular basis. And since my young age, she used to hold my hand, take me there and show me the sufferings that people had since I was young. And that has what has instilled in me the philanthropic nature and the nature to help our communities. Hmm. So two things. So the apple didn't fall far from the tree uh, in terms of you know, uh, the seeds that your mom planted. Uh, as a young as a young man growing up, but then there's something you said that struck me. You said you used to walk to school. Uh, so was your home and school near? Yes and no. My primary school was 15 minutes away. I used to walk. My secondary school was one hour away by walk. I used to stay in Parklands, and my school was in Upper Hill. Okay. Uh, until the time I saved enough pocket money to buy a bus pass, and that was my first bus pass where I had to have four interchanges before it dropped me 15 minutes away from my home. I still had to walk. So from walking to, to owning this uh, realm of, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's mind but let's come back to home still. Uh, are you the firstborn? I'm the secondborn. Second, okay. Tell me about your siblings. So I have uh, two brothers. Mm -hmm. I have an elder brother who is two years older than me, and I have a younger brother who is four years younger than me. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So it's boys only? Boys only. <laughs> so the middle child is the one who took up the business? Correct. How is that possible? Because in our, in our culture, it's always the firstborn. What happened at that point in time, when I was uh, 16 years old, my brother went for his further studies to uh -huh. UK, and he was pursuing an h and D, a a postgraduate degree. Okay. Uh, at the age of 18, Unfortunately, my father passed away. Yeah. I had no choice but to take over his business. Yeah. And at that point in time, I let my brother and I gave him the opportunity to complete his studies and then come and join me in the business. Mm -hmm. So I was the first one to enter my father's business. Yeah. And my brother, elder brother joined me two years later. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, my younger brother came in much later. Right. So at 18 years old, what did you know about running a business? Fortunately for me, uh, as my father started ailing uh, at the age of 16, I know it's an unbelievable story, but whilst I was doing my Form 4 and my higher education exam, I used to multitask, and after school, I used to always go to my father's business. Weekends, I was always there, and those days, we used to work seven days round the clock. And in those two years, my father actually took me through whatever that little business was, and how he ran it, and I learned standing on the job as to what my father's little business was all about. Mm. And just let the audience know the business you're talking about is Kingsway Tires. Kingsway Tires, yes. Mm -hmm. So from one little store, give me the story of uh, the locations yes. and everything. Yes. So from one little small store that my father started in 1960, and uh, that store was actually a former police station, and the road before independence was called the Kingsway. It was the Colonial Street, yeah. and that was the colonial, colonial British police station uh, that used to hold prisoners yeah. where our existing shop is. So my father brought both that prison pre-independence and started a small tire business that he evolved for the next 16 years 
till I came into the business. Yeah. Since then, the business has grown by leaps and bounds. The tyre business itself today has more than 30 outlets countrywide. It's represented in more than 22 counties. We have a very big factory where we also retread tyres and we have evolved in the way that we run the tyre business by having our own super tyre centre. Mm. So it's actually evolved by leaps and bounds. Yes. So at that time, at 18, was that your family's sole source of income? Yes. So the pressure to make it work was real? Yes. Mm. Okay. So who has a question for his background? Ba um, yes, well, Chebet. I, I, so, I just a little, so at that point, at 17, 18, I'd like to know whether you had a vision, whether you were just surviving, or like taking it one day at a time, or thriving, thinking, well, I can grow this business. Were you thinking, I'll just bootstrap? What was the mood? What was going on in your mind? What were your plans? At, at that, those initial years, I think, are so critical for an entrepreneur. So the first two years, uh, as I entered into my father's business and, and as I took it over, my first priority was how do I sustain this business and how do I stop from this business collapsing. My second priority was that my father used to look after a big extended family. And what my father used to do in that small retail shop, it used to be the milk that used to give the cow at that point in time for 12 other family members who today have grown to a size of 30. So my priority was to look after the business, make it sustainable, and at the same time, see how this business could carry on sustaining all the family needs and keep the family going because that was the only sole bread earner that we had in the entire family. So that was my priority at that point in time to sustain it and then to grow it slowly. So you are taking it a day at a time, a day at a time. Yes. So it's not, not necessarily what you have now, like five-year plan, ten-year plan, no. Yes. In those days, I had no other option, yeah. but it was a day-to-day uh, you know, affair of how I ran my business to keep it running and keep it afloat. Yeah. Okay. So three brothers, uh, so one uh, studying abroad, one younger than you, it's you. So did you feel, and you running the business, so did you feel like you were missing out on something, maybe higher education, uh, life with friends, you know, at 18 you want to explore? Yes. I, I always had an aspiration to do my higher education. And fortunately for me, I had that determination. Yeah. So whilst I took over my father's business, I had an opportunity of taking evening courses and completing my bachelor's degree and master's degree studying at the same time. So I managed to educate myself yeah. in the first four years yeah. that I took over the business and I had three caps that I wore, running my father's business, looking after my extended family, and educating myself. And I did it. Was it hard? It was difficult, it was challenging, but I was determined. Because I knew if I did not get myself educated, if I did not get myself sufficient knowledge, hence, I would not be able to take the business to the next level. Brian? Just I would like your response. Um, you say that, you know, the, the milk, the, 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 the job, you know, the business was a cow, and the milk was not just for your family, but other family members okay. that were looking forward to that milk. And I'm relating it to our current life, you know, as this generation, I'm, I fall under the millennials. And, you know, being in a family setup, Everyone is striving and working hard so that they can get their own and they can step aside of the family and start something. So I, do, you, do you relate that resilience and that ability to be able to focus on business, on the responsibility that you knew came after you? You, you, you had to make sure that there's enough revenue that is generated to you know, be able to cater the needs of other family members. Because, for example, even relating to my case, why I'm, I work so hard, you might find it's because I have a family, I have a wife, I have a son, and maybe I have maybe a brother who will never ask for money. 
and that brings us to a place of content. You are contented at a very, you know, minimal output. And even it affects even how we pray, because I believe in your business. You're praying that God provide me so that, you know, I can be able to pay salaries. I can be able to provide. As you're just praying, God bless me so that I pay rent, so I fill my car. So, so do you believe that resilience comes as a result of that, you know, pressure? Yes, certainly. You are absolutely right. And knowing Indian families, uh, you know, we always stay with extended families. And when my father passed away, he left behind an extended family. He had two brothers who passed away before him. And of course, we had the responsibility of looking after those two families, my father's family, and that was that extended family of 16 people that I'm talking about. And most of the siblings were school going at that point in time. So I had that responsibility, and you're absolutely right. Coming with that responsibility of looking after the family also comes with pressure. It puts you under pressure. It gets you going that, yes, you must make sure that this cow is healthy, feed this cow, nurture this cow, so everybody in the extended family can enjoy the milk from this cow and carry on thriving. We run away from family responsibilities. Uh, when there is business uh, in the family, uh, we tend to want to just do it for us. We do not look after our extended family members. Do you think there is contribution in together, togetherness, coming together as an extended family to preserve wealth for that particular family? And how would you advise people to, you know, have that as, as a norm or normal? Because a lot of people run away from working with their family members. Yes, you are absolutely right. Working with extended families is not an easy task. But if you structure your extended family in an appropriate way, it can certainly yield in very good results and it can foster and fuel growth to a level that is beyond imagination. Uh, maybe we will talk about how we as a group com company grew into many different fields uh, that we are in today. Yeah. And why did we grow? We grew because of the strength of our extended family. Mm -hmm. How did we keep our extended family intact? Why? Because at a very young age or at a very early time in our extended family, we brought in something called planning of an extended family. We brought in a family council. We brought in a family constitution. And everybody attested to it, each of the family members or the family units, like we know. Today we are a family of 34. And we are so happy today. Because in a big family, even in a small family, you have quibbles, you have fights. In one kitchen, if you have three ladies, obviously one will say, I want chicken, and the other one will say, I want fish, and the other one will say, nothing doing, I'm vegetarian. <laughs> but you can only imagine uh, the challenges that we have. Yeah. But to, how do we counteract that cha challenge? Mm -hmm. So we restructured our family. We put in a family constitution in place that took care of the family do's and don'ts of the family, and everybody signed to it. In the business, we had a framework of how the business would be structured, how the wealth would be the wealth created would be divided, what would be the roles and responsibilities of each family member entering the business, and what would be the criteria. So we set down set guidelines for anybody to join the family business to grow it. And the final thing that we did, We'll be back after this. In my fourth year in business, I still very, very vividly remember tears that I had in my eyes and the two nights that I cried continuously when whatever little money that I had, I invested into stock for my business 
and I put it in a warehouse. And on one Saturday night, that warehouse caught fire. I didn't have insurance. And all of a sudden, the vision, the dreams that I had were all gone up in smoke. Welcome back. This is What's Your Story on KTN Home. Gratified that you made the time tonight to watch because we will be having a two-part series of extrapolating um, this beautiful story of Dr. Manot Shah from his autobiography, One in a Million. It's available where books are sold and also on Amazon, just in case you haven't had the opportunity to read it. He is fully Kenyan. It's a beautiful Kenyan story. We have learned in part one of the show, just to recap for those who may be joining us now, that this was a business started by his father, and we speak about Kingsway Tires Limited, which now is Kingsway Group, and they have property, or rather, industry in health, property, finance, and automobile, <laughs> Kingsway Tire Automobile. So Dr. Manoj, thank you again thank you. Uh, for being here. So uh, before the break, he said to us, the struggle stopped when you went to, uh, you took your family out on vacation. So at what point in between uh, setting up this business, you going to school, did you meet your lovely wife, Jaina, and start a family? It was a marriage made in heaven, but it was also an arranged marriage. Unfortunately, in those days, I didn't have time to go out and date and have coffee with all those lovely girls and go to the nightclub. But I was fortunate enough uh, to find her at somebody's wedding where both of us were together. Mm -hmm. And of course, the families kind of got together, talked about it, and they said that these are the right two for each other. Right. And that's how it happened. That's really fortunate. Okay, and how old were you when you got married? 25 years. And you've been married now for how long? I've been married now for 38 years. 38. Congratulations. Thank you. What, what keeps a marriage that strong? To be very honest, mm -hmm. it's the meeting of minds to make sure that no matter what happens between you and your wife, mm. keep that smile on. Ah, keep the smile on. Keep the smile on and that keeps the flame of a marriage going. I see that. How many here are married? Oh, four, <laughs> four out of seven. Okay, so keep the smile on, Brian. <laughs> okay, so as with anything in life, whether it's family or business, you obviously have uh, challenges that you have to overcome. The mistake people make now is when they look at your story um, and the assumptions, rather not mistake, that people make is, um, you know, you've had it all going smoothly. You know, it's been, especially when we, we somehow have been programmed to think that uh, for as long as you have money in the bank and petty cash flow and investments that you're averse, you know, problems and challenges uh, you know, they stay away, far away from you. Uh, how, how true or false is that? Uh, to be very honest, uh, that myth is a false from where I come from. For me, money has never been my first thought or my first priority. Because the way I look at it and the way we have built our business empire is around how do we manage the business, how do we manage our wealth whatever we accumulate on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. The common mistake that a lot of people make, and I've seen it over the years, that I've been a professional businessman, Harriet uh, earlier on talked about her business, many new startups, is that a lot of people start up a business, make a little bit of money, and for whatever reason, the m little money that they have made goes into luxury spending or spending on other things besides the business. Whereas for me, I always took a different approach. Right from day one, since my father passed away, I never even had a single cent. We were in a debt. We were almost going to shut down because one of the banks came flying on us that your father was a signatory. He had an overdraft at that time of one million shillings in those years. And they said that if you can't pay this back, we're going to shut you down. Wow. And it was that determination that taught us that why fall when you can fly? This is one of the quotes that's there in the book. Because at that point in time, it was like falling. You know, you had nowhere else to go. It was the end of the world. Darkness was in front of you. 
when the bank comes in and says that your father owes money and we are going to shut down the business. But nevertheless, with sheer determination, we managed to talk to another bank in those years who helped and bailed us out. The lesson that we learned from that experience right from the time I initiated and took over my father's business, every single penny that we made went back into paying uh, the loan that we had taken to keep our business arrive, yeah. alive. From that day onwards, the lesson that my, myself and my brother, my elder brother, and the philosophy that we followed for the family is that out of all the profits that we generate for the business, only 10% goes into spending and the rest, 90%, either goes into savings or is plowed back to grow the business. And one of the reasons why we have succeeded in multiplying and growing our business over the last 40 years is because of that one single factor, yeah. whereas everything that we have made mm. has gone back into expanding our business and expanding our family wealth. So what I hear you saying is don't eat the seed, replant it, replant it, replant exactly. it. Yeah. Okay, who has a question on obstacles, team? Uh, Dr. Ari, um, I, when I read this book about uh, everything that you had gone through from the small uh, boy you were, how you manage the businesses, definitely it's uh, not like a, a, a walk in the park. Uh, there are those uh, obstacles that you went through, definitely, right? And uh, one of the quotes that encouraged me so much, uh, you talked about um, that the struggles that you go today, they are the ones that shape the person that you become in the future. And I tend to agree with you on that perspective. But could you like uh, probably share the real, uh, the greatest obstacles maybe that you went through, especially managing from the different, uh, maybe I can call them departments, from the finance, automobile, health. How did you manage to bring everything together uh, to see the success that uh, you're celebrating today? And also maybe could there be like any other businesses that maybe you had started and then they flopped and then maybe you shifted the focus you, you and then you began uh, maybe you majored on those that uh, were successful yes so that's a very very good question and i i i am a firm believer it is only when you fall 10 times the 11th time you stand up being stronger than before in my journey of becoming a successful entrepreneur I have fallen down more than 10 times. But every time I've got up, I've got up stronger than ever before. In my fourth year in business, I still very, very, very vividly remember the tears that I had in my eyes and the two nights that I cried continuously when whatever little money that I had, I invested into stock for my business and I put it in a warehouse. And on one Saturday night, that warehouse caught fire. I didn't have insurance. And all of a sudden, the vision, the dreams that I had were all gone up in smoke. You can only imagine I was at the lowest level of my life, having been up there and falling down, and how to begin again. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, through sheer determination, you stand up stronger and start rebuilding yourself. And over my journey, it's not been rosy all the way through. There have been very many various factors, uh, and we have had many, many low points in our business that have really brought us down. But every time, we have been more determined than ever before to succeed. Again, not all businesses turn to be fruitation. What, what is important and the lesson that I've learned is that very early in a new startup or in a new business, if you find that your business is not working, call it a day, get over it, and go for something else. I've started very many new businesses in the earlier part of our career. Like everybody else, we also had a dream. We also wanted to make it quick. But at that point in time, we also realized that many of the business ventures that we started were not kind of making money, they were lo making losses. Just to share an example with you, we got an agency to sell sweets, chocolates, and confectionery from a South African company. 
and we thought that that was a beautiful business and will make lots of money. We invested a little bit of our money that we had made in our parent business into starting that business. Little did we realize that the market at that time, 35 years ago in Kenya, was Cadbury's. A lot of people thought that Cadbury was the best chocolate and the sweets that we made here and the lollipops that we made here were the best. And again, from a price perspective, whatever we brought from South Africa did not appeal to whatever we make here. And we realized that very early in the business and we cut our losses and shut down that business. At the same time, we thought that why don't we look at wines and spirits? It's not our cup of tea. It doesn't resonate with the tire business. But yet, my brother says that why don't we try it out and see whether it works. The same thing happened. It didn't work for us and we shut it down. Now, these are classical cases where the business did not work from our favor. But I'll give you another case. We went into the automobile business. And at that point in time, we were very fortunate that we had, had the agency for cars from Korea, a car called Daivu. I don't know how many of you remember the Daivu cars at that time. And we were very famous. We brought in the Daivu cars from Kenya. We set up our service workshop. We set up a whole network around the country. We were extremely successful in marketing the Daivu cars here in Kenya. People were very happy with the product, with the service, with whatever we offered. We ran that business for 10 years successfully, and we thought that this business would never end one day, would never end, and it would still keep on running as a family business. Little did we know that the parent company in Korea would be bought over by the giant General Motors from the United States of America, and hence the business that took us 10 years to build and take it to a, another level crashed overnight. General Motors bought over Daivu. They changed the names. They had an agency here, and they started assembling the same Daivu cars with a different brand name here at the Kenyan assembly plant, and hence we had to close down the automobile business after making it successful, after putting in a lot of sweat, and all of a sudden, one day, it was gone. So these are just some examples of how a journey is like the waves in the sea. So what I'm hearing you say, therefore, is don't be afraid of trying or exploring, um, because then, um, I think it's harder to ask before we started to film, how do you know that this will work? You know, you've gone out, you've done all the, you know, groundwork, best laid plans, and then it works or it doesn't. So how do you know? There are two ways of skinning a cat. Uh, one is the old way of doing it, where you take risk, use your business instincts, use your gut feeling, go for it. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is now the analytical way where you analyze and look at how your business is going to work for you. That's amazing. That's amazing. Eunice, let's hear from you. So my question to you, Dr. Manoj, is what, what is that one thing that makes you keep, um, that makes you want to do more for people who are coming to seek services? For example, at, uh, at the hospital, where, for example, the Konya, the eye bank, where you, you have spearheaded that project and you have ensured that people who have damaged corneas are now able to see again. So what, what is that one thing that makes you want to do more? Because these are people who might not give you anything back in return but you continue to do more and you have changed lives and people are able to now sustain their, 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 their livelihoods. They are not dependent because now they can see. So what, are, what is that one thing that makes you want to do even more and get more funding for these people? Thank, thank you, uh, Eunice, for that question. Uh, healthcare is very close to my heart. Uh, having been, been in the healthcare industry and also been a philanthropist going out and working on the field, I've seen so many people suffering with so many different medical ailments uh, that they cannot find or do not have the resources for getting treated. And hence, what I thought is that, why don't I be the change? And the change comes from necessity is the mother of all inventions. Where there is a need, we must find a way to fulfill the need. 
and it was exactly 15 years ago, working in the eye health industry, I realized that there were so many Kenyans out there. There were so many children out there who had damaged corneas, who had corneal problems. And what a damaged cornea is, in simple layman's term, it's like the windscreen of your car. You have a windscreen in the front of your eye. And if the windscreen of your car, if somebody throws a stone and gets shattered, your vision to see the road is impaired. Looking at the problems that our Kenyans were facing, and at that point in time in Kenya, there was no hope for any people who had corneal blindness, who had their windscreens shattered. There was nothing available here locally that could help them. They had to go to India, where a corneal transplant would cost about $5,000. They had to go to the United States or UK, where it would cost double that amount. And I thought to myself, why should this be the case? Why can't we set up our own eye bank in Kenya and see how we can help these individuals? And at that point in time, an idea came into my mind and I initiated the first eye bank, not only in Kenya, but in East and Central Africa. The whole of East and Central Africa, I set up the first eye bank and I set up the first eye retrieval program where when anybody died in a hospital, we were there to ask them that, please, Mr. or Mrs., can we take the eyes of your loved one and make somebody else's life a better place so somebody else can see with the eyes that we have taken out? And the first question they asked us is that, are you going to remove the whole eye? I said, no, we are only going to remove the windscreen of the eye. Otherwise, the face and everything remains intact. So once we remove the cornea of the eye, we process it and from every one person we harvest corneas, two people can see and we transplant them into people who can't see. Today the national statistics shows that there are 75,000 people in this country waiting for a corneal transplant and the corneas are not available. At our hospital, we had a backlog of 2,750. We have brought that down to 500 today. So that is the success of just one part of what I have done. And I could share with you many other initiatives that we have taken in the health sector. And one is just a recent one where we managed to take two Kenyan children to Morocco to have a cochlear implant done. And as we all know, children when they are born, many of these children are born deaf. And when a child is deaf, that child is also dumb. They cannot speak. And when they grow up, if they are not treated, if they are not, not helped, there is no quality of life for them. There is nobody in Kenya that does cochlear implants. And even if the procedure is done, it's a very costly procedure, exceeding 2.5 million shillings for just a cochlear implant. I managed to take two Kenyan children to Morocco, got them fitted with cochlear implants, and today they are back. They are able to hear what the mother tells them. They are able to speak slowly. And of course, we have started speech therapy and the follow-up so they can lead a normal life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is amazing. I'll take one question before we wind up the show. But we're just winding up this part one and then we'll continue uh, next week. So, Dr. Manoj, I've known you for quite some time and we've been friends. I've shared meals with many leaders that you've shared time with. Um, I'm curious that when you put down your time and you relax and you know, you're not in offices or in board meetings, what are the fun things you do? Because I know you used to drive a rally car. Um, I don't know if you still do that now, but I'll be curious to know what else do you do to make you happy? I, I was a motorsport enthusiast in my younger days and I was thrilled uh, by racing cars and that always used to be a fantasy when I grew up as a small kid and I always wanted to be a racing driver when I saw all those racing drivers that were there in our country. In those years we had the famous safari rally. It, it was my dream to participate in the safari rally and to become a rally driver. I got a car. I prepared it, 
I participated in three safari rallies. I made three attempts. Fortunately, I managed to finish one. And those days, it was the toughest rally, a test of man and machine, endurance, five days, and really on very bad terrain. But I managed to finish one safari rally, and that even 10th overall out of 200 entrants that entered the safari rally. And for me, that was a victory. Coming back to what I enjoy doing most at night, when I take off my tie, sit on the sofa set, put my legs up, the thing that I enjoy the most is watching news. In the one hour that I'm there, I've watched four different channels. My favorite channel is KTN, for sure. <laughs> at the same time, I also look at international news, BBC and CNN, to kind of keep myself updated as to what is happening locally and what's happening internationally. And I do this religiously every day at night. What time do you go to bed every day? Uh, that's a very good question, because I watch the KTN news at 9 o'clock, and by 9.30 or 10, I watch the other news, and it's usually anything after 10.30, 11 o'clock. Wow. And you wake up by? 6.30 or 7 at the most. Okay. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to stop that here for tonight's episode. So next week, uh, we take it forth and hopefully just find a way to just wrap it all up. Obviously, we would, we would not be able to do that, but to the best of our ability, we will. Uh, Dr. Manocha, because everyone here has given a quote, including Timothy, I think, even dropped a quote. Those who haven't quoted next week, please, eh? you'll, you'll leave us a quote. But I want you to look into that camera. And as, as you know, we are very passionate about the youth on this program. And, and so just leave them with a quote that they go to bed with tonight. For all the youth... The quote that I want to share with all of you here this evening is, why fall when you can fly? I want you to think about it. It's a very powerful quote. And really, you can fly if you want to fly. I love that. I love that. Why fall when you can fly? So we stop here. Let's fly next week. Okay. And what's your story? The show goes up on YouTube after this and a repeat. Sunday at 2 p.m. We are open on our social media platforms. That's on KTN Home and also Dr. Manot Shah on all platforms. That's his name. Find him and just go let him know what uh, this conversation means to you tonight. I'm Catherine Wangi. This is What's Your Story. Have a good night.